Welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. With cooler days on the way, our sweaty vision clears to take a new look at our gardens. A great way to get ideas for plants and design is the Garden Conservancy Open Days Tour. Today, check out what's happening on Austin's tour this year. Right now, let's take a closer look at one of the gardens. Viewpoints in the garden are essential to its design. From indoors and out, from close up or from a distance, how do you give your garden multiple personalities? For Ginny and Buddy Jones, viewpoints motivated their design for their home and garden. The garden, through a series of divided spaces that are punctuated by topiary shapes, sort of frames the views from the house, um, as well as gives the property a little bit of structure. Like for most gardeners, 2010's hard freeze set a few plants back. But under Scott's organic care and embellishments, the design stands true as the plants recover. In front, evergreens complement the house without cluttering its architecture. Scott added a new dimension to the view at entrance level and from above on the terrace. There used to be annual color within those parterres that flanked the porte de and um, to be a little more cost effective we decided to shift a few of those interior portions of the parterre to a more permanent plant solution. And the lower petalums are a beautiful contrast to the bright green of the boxwoods. With the respect for views, Scott artistically manicures the ancient oak tree. The garden values close-up views too, emphasizing them with centuries-old vessels. In back, the design for the pool and outdoor dining revolves around multiple perspectives. When it's time for intimate contemplation, step into a cove that frames the home's conservatory view. Like many gardens, it started with a problem to solve. Well, there was a lot of foundation work that went to putting this house together, and uh, so that is a big retaining wall that actually holds the side of the mountain back. Uh, pretty impressive feat of engineering there. Uh, it also creates a, a beautiful little room and a koi pond. Um, and then set in the wall is a very old French fountain uh, that serves as a focal point. A fountain at the conservatory's passage signifies the bond of serenity between home and garden. That one's also French and it was probably at one point a, a well where people would get their water. A narrow walkway alongside carries on the sense of quiet, even while serving as navigation. The cliff plays to advantage to enter a more secretive passage. Atop the cliff, its leafy enclosure harbors the family for personal time together, to play or to just sit and talk. And what would the woods be without a fairy garden? A 
uncluttered refreshment unwinds the spirit on a journey through the woods. There is a rose arbor as you're coming down the hill that uh, has the Lady Banks rose on it that's really beautiful in the springtime. Um, and then some of the large clipped topiaries that sort of give you a sense of walking through a colonnade or it kind of sets up a rhythm as you're walking down the hill. Regardless of season, there's always a surprise to renew the garden's journey. It's not all, you know, right there in front of you. So it's, it is an adventure. As you move around the property, you discover different little surprise spaces. It's a lot of fun. Wow, it feels like coming back down to earth after seeing that garden. Absolutely spectacular. And that will be on the Garden Conservancy's Open Days Tour. And this is one of the most anticipated days in the Austin gardening calendar with good cause. Some of the most spectacular gardens in the community open for you to tour. Joining me now to talk about that are Charlotte Warren and Laura Bowles, who are the co-chairs of the event this yes. year. Thank you for coming on Central Texas Gardener to open these garden gates for us. Oh, thank you, it's our pleasure. We're so excited about the tour this year. Um, it will occur in October on the 16th, Saturday. And um, we have such a lovely, diverse group of gardens. We're, we're really pleased. Well, um, you should be. I've seen the previews of this. Uh, an eclectic mix uh, uh, from the spectacular like we just witnessed to the e eclectic and fun. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. there's, yeah. there's something there that I think every single person will enjoy. Right, right. Well, let's give people kind of the, the who, what, where, when. You've already said October 16th is yes. the day. Yes. And um, this is a one-day event? It's a one-day event. Starts at 9 in the morning, mm -hmm. goes till 5 o'clock in the afternoon, rain or shine. Right. So this will be the day. Okay. And um, all of the gardens will be open. These mm -hmm. are all private gardens, of course, that um, people might rarely get to, a chance to see. Right. And um, tickets are available at various retailers. I'm sure right. we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Sure. Well, people can learn more about it, of course, on our website at klru.org slash ctg. But they're, they're available at um, retail centers all over the city. The locally owned garden shops will have tickets available for, yes. again, for the Garden Days Open, uh, the Garden Conservancy Open Days Tour. Yes. And uh, you can buy a book of tickets or you can buy individually, right? That's correct. You can buy a book of six tickets mm -hmm. for all of the gardens uh, for $25, or you can go to each individual garden and buy a $5 ticket for that particular garden. Well, it's, it's a great way to go out there and steal wonderful ideas, which is one of the things I always encourage people to do is if you want to create a beautiful space, go out there and see some beautiful spaces and bring some of the ideas home. And you know, one of the things that I really enjoy about the, the Conservancy Tour is the fact that um, homeowners, the gardeners themselves, are often there and enjoy interacting with the, the public, right? I think so. I think they're proud of their gardens and enjoy sharing their experiences mm -hmm. with, with others that appreciate what they've done. Right. Well, and you know, gardeners tend to like other gardeners and uh, have sure. fun time and conversing about those mm -hmm. things, so people will have that opportunity. Why don't we start? We've already kind of started on the grand scale with the beautiful garden we just featured, but let's move people through some of the other so the gardens that people are going to see. Now, one that looks really charming to me you're calling East Side Patch as and as the name of the garden and this one just looks like a fun family garden. It is. It's it's owned by Leah and Philip Leverage and they have designed it, installed it and maintained it mm -hmm. all themselves. And it, it's beautiful. They have young children and it is just an extension of their home. Mm -hmm. The children are out playing in the backyard and I think the neighborhood comes over and gathers there. Well, this is on the east side of Austin, obviously, mm -hmm. given that by the name. And what I what I like about what I see here is just the exuberance of the space. I mean, it's a historical cottage, which is great. The, the cottage serves as a backdrop for a garden that just feels playful. It feels like Austin. It does. There are meandering paths, and there is xeric landscaping and structure, and um, it's just a, a wonderful sort of playground for the children, but it's a beautifully inspiring area, mm -hmm. I think, for, uh, for adults, for mm -hmm. us gardeners to go visit. Well, it also strikes me as being a plant person's garden. 
that there are a lot of unusual things in this garden that people can go and see, uh, uh, maybe for the first time. I think so. I think they experiment a good deal there. They have a wonderful website that, um, with with lots of blogging and information for visitors. So. Okay, so that's East Side Patch, and that's going to be a wonderful stop on the tour that people will enjoy. The, the next one we want to talk about is uh, the Ramsey Garden, and this is very different uh, to me. When I, the first time I looked at some of the images of this garden, I immediately thought New Orleans. It very much looks like a New Orleans courtyard. And I think some of the, the wrought iron railing, the fencing at the home is, is antique and was brought from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. and, but it has very much that feel with it. There's no lawn at all. It's all terraced, beautiful pots, lots of furniture, lots of little vignette areas to, mm -hmm. to sit. And, but it's in central Austin, overlooking downtown. So it's hard to believe yeah. that you're in this wooded, tranquil, secluded area just right in the heart of town. Yeah, well, I love the feel of New Orleans. I love that garden. And this, to me, speaks of gentility in a sense. You know, it's, it seems made for entertaining. It, it is. It's just gorgeous. And I'm sure that the family spends lots of time mm -hmm. entertaining there. Um, David Wilson is the landscape architect that has worked very hard on that. And through the transition, the homeowner, the Mrs. Ramsey, that was her childhood home. So there's a lovely continuity of the family in this, mm -hmm. in this home and, and loving in this garden. Well, you kind of feel that. You feel a kind of sense of roots at this place that stretch back. I was wondering if the family actually was from Louisiana or from the south, and it, it certainly feels a part of that part of our gardening heritage, that long tradition of gardening mm -hmm. heritage that comes from Virginia and places like that, South yeah. Carolina. Mm -hmm. Lovely beautiful. space, and it couldn't be more different from Eastside Patch or the other garden we've already featured. So again, it speaks to the diversity of the experiences that are going to be available to the people who go on the tour. And a, a nice shaded space to be in it as well, That's if, if it's a little bit on the hot That's side. True. The next one is a, a little edgy, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is actually includes uh, a saw blade table, which is, uh, speaking of edgy, you know, I don't think people are gonna need to wear leather uh, when they go here, but this is... Uh, but they could. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it certainly uh, looks like a fun space with lots of spectacular plants and plantings. This is just an amazing space. When Laura and I were doing our previews and we visited it, we were just um, really sort of spellbound by the 75 foot tall bamboo um, breaks and then the structures and the paths and the use of metal. Um, this is Utility Research Garden. It's mm -hmm. also on the east side and um, it's just an amazing space. Um, David Cater is this gardener and the owner and does the work and um, is, is quite a specialist with bamboo. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, uh, bamboo remarkable. may be his specialty and, and, and David is well known for introducing many unusual varieties of bamboo to the area. But beyond that, we see plantings here that incorporate lots of grasses and agaves and the like, and absolutely spectacular combinations. So, and that's one of the things I really, I think many Austin designers do extremely well, is counterpoint, say, the sculptural mm -hmm. uh, qualities in, in uh, like the agave with the soft plantings of the grasses, and, mm -hmm. and in this case, bamboo. And the pine trees. There's yeah, some oh, yeah, lovely lots of fir pine, pine oh, in this garden. Just, it's, it's so lush, you almost lose where you are when you walk through this garden. Mm -hmm. And interesting berms on what is really a flat lot, where so he's created lots of interest with, with mm -hmm. the berms and the mm -hmm. plantings on those. And also lots of, um, he's brought in lots of artistic touches using metal as well, which is something else that we like to see, or we do see, I should say, in Austin Gardens is a lot of metal craft being brought into the garden. Mm -hmm. There are drill bits that he's used in an architectural manner and um, large metal sculptural pieces. Uh, the bird bath is just one of the most exquisite things I think I've seen. I really enjoyed it. Well, the bird bath is a lovely kind of glass bowl sitting in a metal object. Yeah, it's a gorgeous basin and vessel, mm -hmm. real pretty. And also, uh, uh, one of the things I see here is lots of architectural rescue pieces incorporated into the stones mm -hmm. and walls and things like yes. that. I think he prides himself in sort of reclaiming things that would have otherwise maybe gone to the trash and mm -hmm. turning them into, you know, a piece of art in, the, in his right. garden. 
Well, I know people will enjoy this, and again, uh, another east side garden, so it's great to see that you, we have some clusters of gardens that are, mm -hmm. people can go to. Mm -hmm. Another central Austin garden has been on the tour before, and that is um, one of the tour or leading organizers, Deborah Hornickel, has graciously opened her garden for years, and this is a place that has evolved tremendously. So one of the things I'd like to tell people is it, for those gardens that are repeated on the tour, you get to see how a garden has evolved and changed. And in this case, the house has changed, so the gardens had to respond to that, right? That's correct. Deborah has enlarged her home, and as a result, the fish pond has been relocated. Her dining table outside has been moved. Um, there's a large lo a lemon tree that has been relocated and is thriving. So um, just structurally, the garden has changed, but the, the, the whole um, experience in the garden is mm -hmm. still as wonderful as it was, if not better. Yeah, well, it was always a, a lovely sight um, and a, a, f a formal touch, of course. Yes. Um, it, she started off with what was a uh, alley of pear trees and yes. has turned into this incredible tunnel of pear trees. <laughs> now, that's still there. Please tell oh, me. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. good. Yes. Beautiful. And at night with the lights, it's just, it's mm. just spectacular. Uh -huh. So that's Deborah Hornicle's garden. That's very central, right off of 35th Street, yes, easy, it is. right in the center of town. And the piece de la resistance, <laughs> in, in many ways, is uh, James David's uh, spectacular garden in uh, Westlake mm -hmm. area. And it is uh, really one of the, I think, uh, the best gardens in the state and renowned throughout the nation in so many ways. It is a spectacular garden, and um, we're so fortunate that James is opening it again this year for the tour. He's the national chairman for Open Days and um, sort of leads us along the, the path toward thinking greater thoughts and bigger thoughts and um, much creativity with, with his work mm -hmm. in his own garden. And speaking of gardens that have changed, I understand that uh, James is, a couple of years ago when we were in that drought situation, James dutifully turned off the sprinklers in large areas of his garden. And as a result, of course, th the garden responded to that and changed. Uh, some plants died, others did not thrive. But he's had to go through a lot of changes and has made those adjustments so people will be able to see how he's dealt with the hardships of Texas. I think that's true. I think we've all learned so much through the last drought and then the cold winter, of course. But um, James has done that as well. Tr areas that were shaded in the past mm -hmm. are no longer shaded and becoming more of an arid sort of location now. Okay, so the uh, people can learn more about it uh, either on our website, klru.org slash ctg or gardenconservancy.org slash open days. Uh, it's going to be happening on Saturday the 16th. Yes. $25 for a book of six tickets. Correct. It's going to be a great day. Thank you both so much for coming on and sharing information about the Garden Conservancy's Open Doors, uh, Open Days Tour. I know it's going to be a great one. Thank, Thank you. It's our pleasure. pleasure. Okay. And coming up next, it's our friend Daphne Richards. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. Our question this week was sent in by Michelle, who has some photos of her vinca, with her, which are having some issues. She wants to know what is making the leaves on her vinca fold up. Well, from the photos that I see, I can definitely say that these are leaf rollers. If you unfold those leaves, you'll either see frass, which means that the insects have already pupated and, and are now feeding or have fed and are gone, or you'll see the pupa, which looks like webbing. You may also see the little culprit himself, and he does look just like a small caterpillar. These leaf rollers are small caterpillars. There's many different species of moths and butterflies that have larvae with this type of leaf rolling growth strategy. Unlike some moths and butterflies, leaf rollers are not terribly host specific, such as your monarch and your milkweed, which only feed on that plant. I saw some leaf rollers on my Budlia in the early spring of this year, so those were obviously a different species because of the timing than this one that's occurring now. I consulted my colleague, Wizzy Brown, who's our entomologist, and she says that right now we're seeing quite a few leaf rollers on vinca plants. One substance that works very well on all caterpillars is Bt. But when I have leaf rollers, unless it's a really bad infestation, I just live and let live, especially on a mature plant which recovers very easily. You can also use a contact insecticide containing spinosad or neem, 
or you can use a systemic that's labeled for the caterpillars that you're trying to kill. Another option is simply to remove those leaves and toss them out. On a small to medium infestation, that's probably your best option. On a large infestation, you may try to remove all of the infested leaves and let the plant recover. Those infested leaves won't recover anyway, but pruning the plant will encourage it to put on new growth. Our plant this week is silverleaf ponyfoot, Dichondra argentea. It's a great ground cover, it's evergreen, and it's grown for its beautiful silver light green foliage. It has a wonderful way of creeping along the ground and quickly filling in space. It also looks great as a, in a container as the short element. It cascades beautifully over the edge of containers. It's low water use, it can handle light shade or filtered sun under trees, and it also loves the full sun. To do this week in your garden, you need to start looking for a brown patch, especially if you have St. Augustine. Our nighttime temperatures are cooling off and the environment is perfect for this disease to take off. So you need to practice good cultural controls. Water only in the early morning and mow every five to seven days, or more often if we're getting a lot of rainfall and the grass is growing quickly. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org slash ctg to send us your question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with William Glenn for Backyard Basics. Hello. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about fungus. Uh, when I say fungus, it might evoke an image of a mushroom or maybe spots on your roses for us gardeners. Uh, it might even just make you think about a time you had some itchy feet. Those are all associated with fungi, but what we're talking about today is called a mycorrhizal fungus. Really, the word mycorrhiza literally translates to fungus root, and that's what we're talking about, is this interaction between fungi and roots of plants in our landscape or in nature. Mycorrhizal fungus really associate with about 90 to 95 percent of plants in nature, and they're a critical part of the nutrient uptake when we're talking about the plant's ability to harvest nutrients from the soil. Now, the fungus benefits from this relationship by getting much needed carbohydrates that the plant produces in its photosynthetic processes. And the plant, in turn, gets the ability for this mycorrhiza to almost make, make a sheath around the, the root and in some cases actually get into the root. And then from there, it will go into areas of the soil that the uh, plant's roots can't actually infiltrate. The diameter of the mycorrhizal roots is a fraction of the size of the plant's roots. So really what it's able to do is go out there, get water for the plant, get nutrients for the plant. One of the most important nutrients is uh, phosphorus. Now, phosphorus, if you've ever seen a soil test, usually tests pretty high in central Texas. Um, but you'll see on there that it'll say unavailable phosphorus. Well, what does this mean? I, do I need to put phosphorus or do I not? Well, that's a tricky question. Phosphorus is a difficult element for plants to uptake, but it's not difficult for mycorrhiza to uptake it. Really what they can do is they can go to that phosphorus, release an enzyme, and make that phosphorus available to themselves, and in turn they will bring that back to the plant. They do the same thing with water. They go and infiltrate areas of the soil, small cavities that the plant's roots can't infiltrate. They mine and harvest water and bring it back to the plants. Now, why is this important? Well, if you think about how hot our Texas summers can get, um, what's the thing that we have to do a lot, especially with our trees, our most important landscape investment? We have to water them a lot, especially in those first one, two, three summers. It's really critical. Well, this mycorrhiza is making our job a lot easier because basically it's going out and bringing water back from areas that the plant can't. Well, if I said that this is in nature, which it is, why isn't it in my yard already? Well, we're competing against compaction, asphalt, sidewalks. We're also dealing with erosion, tillage, air pollution. There's all kinds of things that can sort of reduce this mycorrhizal population. So we want to re-inoculate our landscapes. Um, it's very easy to do. There are gels that are available as concentrates. Those are more for agricultural purposes, but there are also granular forms and uh, soluble powders that you can add right to your watering can or to your hose and sprayer if you want to inoculate everything. Um, I'd like to call your attention to a little experiment that I did, and this is only about a two-week-old experiment. It's kind of cool because you can look at these two coleus. I inoculated one of them with a soluble um, mycorrhizal powder, and I didn't with the other. I didn't add any fertilizer, just a high-quality potting soil. And basically, when I lift this pot up, it's clear, 
on the one with the mycorrhizal inoculant, I can see a whole matrix of new roots. These plants' roots are just really thriving and making right across the bottom all these new, um, very vigorous white roots. And that's an indication that they're being fed. The mycorrhizae itself is imperceptible, but the plant is thriving because of it. And after only two weeks, you can see a noticeable difference. So I would say the next time you're at a nursery and you're getting yourself a new plant, really consider that small investment. It's very inexpensive and you can apply it, especially right to those trees, uh, right to the root systems, I should say, and really enable that plant to thrive right off the bat. So make sure that you go out and uh, get yourself some mycorrhiza and I promise you won't be disappointed with the results. For Backyard Basics, I'm William Glenn. We'll see you next time. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and read our blog. Next week, see how to get a rosier perspective on roses. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.